for joining our next session regarding tardive dyskinesia, which will discuss across the complexity spectrum from quality of life improvement to novel treatments. My name is Juhi Jimenez Shahed, and I'm the Medical Director of Movement Disorders Neuromodulation and Brain Circuit Therapeutics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And I'll be joined by Dr. Rajiv Kumar, who's the Medical Director of Rocky Mountain Movement Disorder Center in Englewood, Colorado. So these are our disclosures. And uh, this educational program is uh, supported by an educational grant from Neurocrine Biosciences. The learning objectives for our presentation today will be to describe the updated recommendations and screening strategies for improved tardive dyskinesia recognition across the spectrum of TD severity and symptoms, integrate key clinical trial data and updated guideline recommendations for treatment with vesicular monoamine transporters type 2 inhibitors into your clinical practice, and to develop cross-disciplinary care plans with psychiatry clinicians to facilitate improved collaborative care of patients with tardive dyskinesia. So this slide is just a reminder that there are still high usage rates of atypical antipsychotic medications as a result of expanding indications, which of course, as a consequence, exposes more patients to risk of developing tardive dyskinesia. So this graph on the um, left-hand side of the screen here shows you the development of some of these medications where medications such as clozapine were first developed in 1989. Subsequent uh, to that, multiple medications were approved and there have been various uh, changes to the labels over time uh, regarding the potential side effects of these medications. Now in 2018, the number of patients that were estimated to be taking antipsychotic drugs in, were uh, over 7.3 million. Uh, and amongst those, the vast majority were taking atypical antipsychotic medications while about 1.3 million uh, patients uh, were exposed to typical antipsychotic drugs. So this uh, usage of these medications is definitely still uh, quite uh, prominent um, amongst our population. Now there are important consequences of D2 receptor blockade. So these antipsychotic drugs largely work because they're blocking uh, D2 receptors. And unfortunately there are various consequences that can occur as a consequence of that. The left-hand side of this slide shows a dopaminergic nerve uh, terminal and synapse. So you have the presynaptic nerve terminal here that is manufacturing uh, dopamine and releasing it into the synaptic cleft. And you have a postsynaptic neuron here that is populated by uh, dopamine receptors. And when you have blockaded these D2 receptors shown here with the red bars, uh, that tends to create an upregulation of those receptors, which is shown here on the right-hand image. Um, and these upregulated dopamine receptors are also at the same time becoming hypersensitive and actually have an increased affinity to dopamine. So then when you have sort of normal uh, dopaminergic transmission within the system that has upregulated dopamine receptors, that actually creates excess inhibition of the stop signal resulting in excess go signals. If you remember back to basal ganglia anatomy, this is referring to the indirect and the direct pathways. And as a consequence of this, uh, patients can develop involuntary movements that we generally refer to as dyskinesia. And in the cases we'll talk about uh, of tardive dyskinesia, this can be particularly problematic. Now, this is further complicated by the fact that any kind of medications that increase dopamine levels can then exacerbate tardive dyskinesia by providing excess go signals and less stop signals. And so we have to be particularly careful in patients uh, who need to also be treated with those types of medications. So what exactly is tardive dyskinesia? Tardive dyskinesia is a type of involuntary movement that typically emerges after long-term use of dopamine receptor blocking drugs, including the antipsychotic drugs that we mentioned and certain antiemetic or GI prokinetic medications. The word tardive really refers to the fact that these movements appear or tend to appear late in the course of exposure to these medications. And the term dyskinesia, as I alluded to, really just refers to a distortion or an impairment of voluntary movement. So dyskinesia is quite a generic term and it can refer to a number of different types of involuntary movements. Uh, but the key point with tardive dyskinesia is that it can become socially stigmatizing and functionally impairing for patients who are suffering from it. And unfortunately, once it begins, it is reversible in only a small minority of patients with some estimates uh, showing that only 13% of patients will have reversible symptoms with complete withdrawal of the dopamine receptor blocking medication. Now the term tardive syndrome is gaining popularity to encompass uh, the more uh, broad uh, spectrum of drug-induced movement disorders such as tardive dystonia and other phenomenologies. And so you might hear it referred to in that way as well. 
So this slide is uh, full of a bunch of different figures, but I think brings home the point that for a long time, tardive dyskinesia was associated um, or, or more commonly associated with first generation antipsychotics. And there was a uh, thinking that uh, patients who are exposed uh, to second, uh, second generation antipsychotics might have either a low risk or no risk of developing tardive dyskinesia. And unfortunately, the annualized TD incidence, although it is higher with first generation antipsychotics, is still present with those second generation medications. Same for the risk and annualized rates. Uh, those are lower with uh, the second generation antipsychotics, but not absent. And certainly the prevalence is lower with those patients treated with second generation antipsychotics. However, we do need to remember that the risk still exists and patients treated only with second generation medications can still develop this problem. And based on the usage rates of these different medications there are estimated to be about 500,000 individuals in the United States dealing with tardive dyskinesia at this point in time. There are certain risk factors that are known to be associated with tardive dyskinesia. Some of these are modifiable and some of them are non-modifiable. Uh, certain things like older age, female gender, uh, patients who are African-American who have had longer exposure to dopamine receptor blocking agents. These are all patients who we know have higher risk of developing TD. Also individuals with a history of brain damage or dementia, or if they even have cognitive disturbance as a result of their psychiatric condition, uh, maybe the presence of a major affective disorder, these are also associated with higher risk of, of tardive dyskinesia. Patients with a history of alcohol or substance abuse who are concomitantly using medications such as lithium or anti-Parkinsonian agents, uh, patients who have had early onset of extra, extra pyramidal symptoms, and those who have a history of diabetes and are HIV positive, all of these are, uh, as I mentioned, known risk factors. And it really kind of behooves us to think about these factors when selecting uh, whether a patient should or should not be treated with a dopamine receptor blocking agent. Now there are um, certainly several consequences to development of tardive dyskinesia. And these can span not only the functional domains, but also the psychosocial domains, the physical domains, and even uh, can affect psychiatric stability in patients who are suffering from this condition. And it's important to remember uh, that there is more than just the cosmetic effect of the involuntary movements that can be problematic for patients who have this condition. So how do we recognize tardive dyskinesia? There are a number of different uh, movement disorders that can be associated with dopamine receptor blocking agent exposure. And so sometimes it's useful to be able to think about these in terms of when those movements occur in relationship to the exposure itself. So if there is an acute onset of a movement disorder following exposure to a dopamine receptor blocker, um, those are usually of the phenomenology of dystonia. So you can get these acute dystonic reactions. Sometimes that can take the form of an oculogyric crisis. A more subacute presentation of a movement disorder following exposure would be something like neuroleptic malignant syndrome or akathisia, even Parkinsonism. That's usually not something that happens right away after um, initial exposure. And then there's the group of conditions that we are covering here today, which is the tardive disorders, all of which require exposure to those dopamine receptor blocking agents, um, but are later in their onset after that exposure. And so you can have uh, kind of a dyskinesia, a dystonia, an akathisia, and sometimes other phenomenologies can be um, present, um, but we'll focus on the first uh, three there. If we think about drug-induced movement disorders in general, we know that there's a variety of different um, types of movement disorders of which tardive dyskinesia is one. Certainly patients can also develop drug-induced Parkinsonism. They can uh, um, develop dystonias, akathisias. Uh, but amongst patients who are taking antipsychotics, about 20 to 35% will develop uh, Parkinsonism, up to 30% will develop tardive dyskinesia, and uh, frequently these two uh, conditions can coexist. And it's really important for us to be able to have the appropriate differential diagnosis in order to be able to pursue the appropriate management and care of uh, that particular movement problem. The typical clinical course of tardive dyskinesia is, um, can be variable. Uh, but there are a few things that we kind of recognize. Patients may begin dopamine receptor blocking agent therapy. Uh, tardive dyskinesia itself can occur within three months of exposure. So it's important to kind of uh, think about that time frame, even if it's uh, three months, only three months after the exposure begins. But a more general um, uh, presentation would be involuntary movements that occur after one or two years of therapy. And another uh, feature that we recognize is that these involuntary movements can also present after discontinuation of the offending medication. 
The severity can also be quite variable. Some patients may have mild symptoms that they may not even be aware of and are only pointed out by other family members or friends, or they can be severe and disabling as we've alluded to. Um, that up to 10% of patients who are treated with long-term neuroleptic medications may experience considerable functional impairment. And as we've talked about, since the remission rates are low, these symptoms are chronic uh, and they can actually even vary in severity over time. We talked a little bit about the persistence of symptoms uh, and following discontinuation of neuroleptic therapy, the estimates show that um, uh, the persistence rates are for anywhere from 67% to 89%. So usually once it happens, it is here to stay. And so it behooves us to recognize it and to treat it appropriately. So the phenomenology can be variable as well. The distribution of involuntary movements can be all over the body. One of the most common presentations, of course, is the oral buccal lingual uh, stereotypies that we can see, such as the lip smacking or chewing movements, tongue movements. But it can also affect the distal limbs and the trunk, uh, where there may be um, kind of back and forth movements. There can be choreiform movements and even uh, respiratory muscle involvement as well. And the patients may uh, be sitting in front of you looking actively short of breath, but really what this is, is just an involuntary diaphragmatic movement. Now, these movements tend to be suppressed by voluntary tasks, but they can increase with stress and they can be variably distractible. And we have to be sort of in tune with those dynamics as we're examining patients who are uh, dealing with these problems. So here's a video example of a patient who has fairly typical tardive or buccal lingual stereotypies. You also saw some respiratory muscle involvement there as he looked like he was sort of short of breath. Here again, uh, or buccal lingual. This patient also has some neck dystonia on top of the or buccal movements. Uh, same with this patient, uh, some neck stereotypies or chorea. And then this patient uh, has some uh, sort of leg uh, repetitive movements that might be more concerning actually for akathisia or tardive akathisia. This patient um, has some orobuchal movements as well as some dystonic posturing of the distal upper extremities. And finally, this patient has some lingual movements that are really only visible uh, when you have the patient uh, open their mouth. So the tardive dystonia, on the other hand, is usually a, a focal or segmental uh, distribution of muscle involvement, usually the head or neck and trunk uh, combined with an upper extremity. Uh, but the patients can have various combinations of blepharospasm, trismus, jaw opening, tongue protrusion, uh, retrocollis, even epistotonic posturing. And one of the most classic presentations of tardive dystonia is a younger male who develops the onset of internal uh, rotation of the shoulders with extension of the trunk and uh, the retrocollis. And, and that's what we kind of put together as the epistotonic posturing, um, which is a very painful and uncomfortable condition, um, which uh, is also uh, in the category of Tardive syndrome as well. Tardive akathisia, on the other hand, is more uh, characterized by restlessness, and so there aren't these repetitive patterns of movements, but the patient is volitionally moving in order to relieve these uncomfortable sensations. They can occur in combination with the classic orolingual buccal movements, uh, and again, these can often be distressing and uncomfortable for the patient. So various patterns here can be things like leg kicking and trunkle rocking, walking and pacing around is something that you might notice your patient's doing, and sometimes even the moaning can also uh, be a part of this as well. Now, the clinical diagnosis of tardive dyskinesia can be made in a couple of ways. There are some more formal uh, criteria called the schooler cane diagnostic criteria, which really have some stringent recommendations about the duration of exposure and the severity of the dyskinetic movements. Um, but these are largely used for research. And on a clinical basis, you can really uh, diagnose somebody with tardive dyskinesia on less stringent uh, criteria. And so we typically will use the DSM-5, uh, which describes patients who have involuntary athetoid or choreiform movements that last at least a few weeks developing in association with the use of a neuroleptic medication for at least a few months. So there's some vagueness there to the time course, uh, but I think allows us to be flexible in terms of um, how we can diagnose this condition. Now, they also in the DSM-5 allude to the uh, movement disorders that can occur after discontinuation of the medication, and it draws an important distinction from a condition called withdrawal emergent dyskinesia, which is usually self-limited and lasts for less than four to eight weeks. And if there are movements that persist beyond those eight weeks, then we are more concerned about the diagnosis of tardive dyskinesia. The AIMS scale is the um, 
symptom scale that is usually used to rate the severity of tardive dyskinesia symptoms. And so you see here in the red box what is sort of uh, the main components of this AIM scale where you have seven different body regions that are scored on a scale of zero to four in terms of their severity, either no movements, minimal movements, mild movements, moderate movements, or severe uh, movements. And there's a maximum score of 28. Um, and then there's kind of a global judgment score, which talks about the severity of abnormal movements overall. And so you can add up all these numbers to get a total severity rating. So another important part that I think is uh, worth discussing is being able to distinguish between tardive dyskinesia and drug-induced Parkinsonism. So everything that moves is not tardive dyskinesia and vice versa. Drug-induced Parkinsonism is a condition that usually occurs within a few weeks of exposure to a dopamine receptor blocking agent. Usually these patients will have tremor and the tremor itself is rhythmic and faster than what we would typically see in the tardive dyskinesia movements. And I'll show you a video in just a moment. Uh, jaw tremor and hand tremor are both uh, can be present and are usually synchronous. And they usually come along with associated bradykinesia and rigidity. As we talked about, this Parkinsonism can coexist with the tardive dyskinesia, so it's important to be able to recognize in an individual patient which features are the tardive dyskinesia components and which are the drug-induced Parkinsonism uh, components. Now, the good news about drug-induced Parkinsonism is that that will typically resolve with discontinuation of the dopamine receptor blocking agent, whereas tardive dyskinesia often does not, as we already talked about. Here's a video of a patient with Parkinsonism. You can see in the left upper extremity here, there's a resting tremor, uh, particularly of the index finger. Uh, you'll see here a little bit of a lip and jaw tremor that is also present. And during other examination techniques that we use for looking at tremor, you see a little bit of postural tremor. Here is testing for bradykinesia. Um, which in the right upper extremity does not uh, look to be very prominent. Here is a depiction of uh, assessing for rigidity. And uh, you might feel a cogwheeling pattern or just a generalized increase in tone throughout the range of movement. And then here, when the patient is walking, you can see that there's reduced arm swing on the right-hand side, which is also a feature of Parkinsonism. Um, and in some cases, you may also notice the hand tremor being present during ambulation, though not in this particular case here. So again, as we talked about, drug-induced Parkinsonism and tardive dyskinesia can co-occur. And sometimes the development of drug-induced Parkinsonism or other early onset EPS is a risk factor for the later development of tardive dyskinesia. And this video that you're watching now is a patient who has kind of a combination of Parkinsonism and, and uh, TD. You can see the TD predominantly in the oral buccal movements. You see them more here when he's doing some of these other tasks. Uh, but then there was also uh, some tremor that was present um, and uh, that is, again, as we said, important to distinguish because the tremor and the Parkinsonism might be treated a certain way uh, versus the tardive dyskinesia, which would be treated a different way. So again, this table uh, summarizes the differences between tardive dyskinesia and drug-induced Parkinsonism, both in terms of the onset and the um, uh, changes that might happen with discontinuation of the medications. Uh, another feature that's important to remember is that anticholinergics might worsen tardive dyskinesia, though they might improve the tremor of Parkinsonism. And then as you'll hear through the rest of the presentation, VMAT2 inhibitors can be successfully used to treat tardive dyskinesia, but at the same time might worsen uh, the Parkinsonism. So there are some uh, things that we need to be careful about. And then amantadine is a medication that can be used in either condition. It might improve tardive dyskinesia and it might improve uh, Parkinsonism as well. And so the treatment recommendations when coexisting drug-induced Parkinsonism and tardive dyskinesia are seen are to usually maybe try to treat the Parkinsonism first with something like amantadine and switching the antipsychotic medication to one that has lower D2 affinity, such as maybe clozapine or quetiapine. And then if the troublesome tardive dyskinesia symptoms persist, then consider more specific treatments for uh, the tardive dyskinesia. So this last uh, slide here just really talks about some of that um, uh, communication and sort of co-management that needs to occur between psychiatry and neurology. So as you might imagine, patients with psychiatric disease who develop involuntary movements um, should and, and often are referred for neurologic evaluation for definitive diagnosis. Some of the situations where we are more likely to uh, kind of receive these referrals are when there is some uncertainty about the movement disorder diagnosis. So perhaps there's some atypical features, maybe there's a family history of a movement disorder or a pre-existing movement disorder that now is either complicating or coexisting with the tardive dyskinesia. 
Um, when patients have significant dystonia, that's also a common reason for referral, and these are important to recognize because they might be particularly um, well um, uh, suited for treatment with botulinum toxin injections. If there's a lack of response to the current drug treatment, or if there's persistent Parkinsonism despite uh, dose adjustment or discontinuation of the antipsychotic medication. So I think it is behooves us as neurologists to really kind of understand the reason for the referral and the consultation and to work closely with the psychiatrist in managing these patients. And so a key learning point that we want to make sure um, that is uh, clear is that it is important to distinguish between drug-induced Parkinsonism and tardive dyskinesia because they can vary in both their onset and their pathophysiology as well as their clinical management. And uh, the time course of onset of these symptoms is particularly an important clue. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, the remainder of the presentation over to Dr. Kumar, uh, who will talk next about treating tardive dyskinesia. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you for joining us this afternoon to learn about treatment of tardive dyskinesia. And I'm going to continue from where my good colleague, Dr. Jui Shahed Jimenez has, uh, has taken you. And my focus now will be on the actual treatment rather than understanding the pathophysiology and epidemiology, which he's already done. So our goal of treatment in tardive dyskinesia is first of all, to maintain psychiatric stability because in general, the main thing that is of concern in these individuals is the main is the psychiatric problem, and the movement disorder problem is secondary. So, uh, you know, we want to treat patients to improve the tardive dyskinesia without overtreating them. And the main treatment we use are as the new VMAT or vesical monoamine transporter type two inhibitors. And one's goal should be to reduce the TD so it's no longer interfering with activities of daily living, causing physical problems such as dental damage, causing embarrassment, interfering with interaction with others such as socialization or work, and it's not adversely affecting mood or psychiatric problems. Uh, and so we want to reduce the severity again so that these things are improved, but without overtreating the patient, attempt to eliminate all the TD. In doing so, we're more likely to cause drug induced Parkinsonism or cause some degree of sedation with higher doses of EMAT2 inhibitors. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, historically, our treatment would have been to uh, try to remove the causative drug. And in doing so, in general, one shouldn't necessarily expect that the TD will improve because in general, TD, once it's established, tends to persist. But we want to prevent the TD from worsening over time by continuously by continually exposing the patient to the, to the um, uh, dopamine receptor blocking medication. Now, in many cases, that may not be possible because the patient continues to require the antipsychotic for control of the underlying mood disorder. However, in some circumstances, that may be possible. And when withdrawing the antipsychotic, you're going to do so gradually because you don't want to precipitate worsening of mood or, or psychosis. Indeed, also, when reducing dopamine receptor blocking, you may increase transiently the severity of the TD, so-called withdrawal dyskinesia. And in fact, in patients who don't have TD, it can briefly emerge. Now, in when, when changing the antipsychotic, uh, if the patient continues to require an antipsychotic, one may consider in consultation with psychiatry to switch from a higher potency antipsychotic to a lower potency D2 receptor blocker, such as quetiapine or clozapine. Now, the, um, uh, we want to, of course, avoid medications that can worsen tardive dyskinesia. And this includes anticholinergics. Anticholinergics are often given to patients who have drug-induced Parkinsonism because they indirectly promote increased dopaminergic tone. However, this can worsen stereotypy and chorea in patients with tardive dyskinesia. However, this is not necessarily the case in patients who have tardive dystonia predominantly. So in that circumstance, anticholinergics may be appropriate. Historically, a number of medications have been used to treat tardive dyskinesia. And these include GABA agonist medications and ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, as well as amantadine, for example. Now, the evidence for these uh, medications being very helpful is relatively low, as compared to the newer generation VMAT2 inhibitors, such as valbenazine and dutetrabenazine. And here you can see the updated recommendations for treatment of tardive dyskinesia from the American Academy of Neurology. <clears throat> 
So there are a number of VMAT2 inhibitors, uh, and I've already mentioned valbenazine and dutetrabenazine. There's an older uh, VMAT2 inhibitor, tetrabenazine, which is approved for treatment of Huntington's disease associated with chorea, but not for tardive dyskinesia, although there are significant predominantly retrospective clinical trials supporting its benefit. Amantadine, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, is, can be used in drug-induced Parkinsonism, and there is some predominantly uncontrolled data suggesting it can be helpful for patients with tardive dyskinesia. So the main role of amantadine may be in patients, for example, who have simultaneous drug-induced Parkinsonism plus tardive dyskinesia. Clonazepam and other benzodiazepines can have some mild benefit. If patients have a significant dystonic component, such as tardive dystonia or tardive, uh, tardive cervical dystonia, botulinum toxins may be, uh, may be helpful. And in patients who have jaw clenching associated with their stereotopy, especially if it's causing pain or dental damage, botulinum toxin injections of the jaw closing muscles can be helpful. For patients who have severe refractory tardive dyskinesia, despite maximal therapy with VMAT2 inhibitors and often some of these other therapies too, then deep brain stimulation can be highly effective. And it's a very nice um, um, uh, uh, data suggesting the marked efficacy in these refractory cases. So let's go back to VMAT2. And one should be aware that VMAT2 is located on the synaptic vesicle and is responsible for transporting neurotransmitters, a number of different monoamines from the, the cytoplasm into the synaptic vesicle. When blocking VMAT2, one depletes the interest, the synaptic monoamine and more of the, uh, of the monoamine, such as dopamine remains in the cytoplasm. So you get a relatively dopamine depleted presynaptic vesicle. So in response to the action potential, one releases less dopamine, one has less uh, stimulation of postsynaptic D1 and D2 receptors, and as a result, one effectively reduces movement. Now, I've already reviewed with you, of course, these two, these three different uh, VMAT2 inhibitors and their different approvals. And uh, in tardive dyskinesia, we are predominantly talking about now use of valbenazine and dutetrabenazine, which is a deuterated form of tetrabenazine, which has some advantages as being only dosed twice a day versus three times a day with tetrabenazine and having a relatively better adverse effect profile compared to tetrabenazine. Now, the data in both the short and the long term for efficacy for both dutetrabenazine and valbenazine is very good. The primary endpoint in the controlled phase three clinical trials for both dutetrabenazine and tetrabenazine was the AIM severity score or abnormal involuntary movement score, which is a scale of uh, goes from zero to 28. And in these studies, the average AIM severity score was roughly a nine or a 10 at baseline. And we can see that with titration of the medication, there is improvement by approximately three to three and a half points in the treated group at an efficacious dose with dutetrabenazine being at 24 or 36 milligrams per day. And indeed, this is approved up to 48 milligrams per day. And there's a dose-dependent effect seen um, typically in the flexible dose studies. And uh, we can see that with valbenazine, we see a similar improvement of about three to three and a half points. Now, what about uh, adverse effect profile? Well, for dutetrabenazine, we can see in yellow that it's a well-tolerated medication. And in fact, if we compare it to the placebo-treated arm, actually placebo has a higher incidence of headache, somnolence, and fatigue. And we can see that the most common adverse effects are things such as diarrhea, nasopharyngitis, and insomnia. If we think about uh, valbenazine, this also has its own unique pattern of adverse effects. We see in this case, actually, somnolence is significantly greater than placebo, as are anticholinergic side effects, balance problems, headache, nausea, vomiting, and arthralgia. And we can see over the long term, if we look at one to two years, we see interestingly that the improvement seems to increase over time. There may be some long-term pharmacodynamic effect of long-term uh, VMAT2 inhibition that results in increasing benefit in this very psychiatrically ill and severely affected uh, group of individuals. And so we see an improvement by around seven to eight points in the AIM severity score if we look at one to two years for both uh, dutetrabenazine, and we see a similar pattern with valbenazine. And for both of the medications then, we see then that there is a uh, statistically significant and very clinically important improvement with improvements in both the, the clinical global impression and the, in, rated by the investigator and marked improvements um, in the patient global impression for both medications. So 
how do you choose between these two medications? Well, there are no head-to-head -head studies, and uh, both medications clearly are indicated uh, and very efficacious. Uh, valbenazine has the advantage of being once a day, but has less, less uh, dosing uh, uh, flexibility. And so with dutetrabenazine, which is dosed twice a day, you have more, more dosing flexibility to try to find, if you like, the sweet spot where you get optimal improvement in the target of dyskinesia and lesser adverse effects. In general, one starts at a low dose and gradually increases over time to get optimal benefit uh, without causing significant adverse effects. You might consider the side effect profile too. We saw, uh, again, although there are no head-to-head -head studies, that sedation seems to be greater uh, compared to placebo with valbenazine, whereas this is not the case with dutetrabenazine. So, and interestingly, some patients tolerate one drug better versus the other. So again, if you have a patient who has some degree of intolerability, maybe sedation with valbenazine, they may do very well and tolerate uh, dutetrabenazine. So, uh, don't give up on your patient. Think about switching when you are not getting the effect that you wish with an individual patient. Now, if a patient requires uh, antipsychotic drug management on an ongoing basis, that is fine. And in fact, in these uh, studies, about 75% of patients were on and continued to take antipsychotics while they were the VMAC2 inhibitor was administered. And in fact, of course, most patients who have a primary psychotic illness, such as schizophrenia, or many patients who have bipolar disorder, need to continue their antipsychotic to maintain psychiatric stability. So it's okay to continue the any, antipsychotic. It's also okay to continue other mood stabilizers, such as, for example, lamotrigine or lithium. And it's okay to continue antidepressants also. In fact, more than half of the patients in these studies continued on antidepressants. Now, despite these, this being a very psychiatrically ill population, giving VMAT2 inhibitors did not significantly destabilize the patient psychiatrically or induce suicidality. One would think that by depleting dopamine, you might do so, but indeed that was not the case. So that's very reassuring that you can give these medications to this ill population. Let's look at, uh, this is a patient of mine. We can see the patient on the left side uh, 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 prior to or uh, VMAT2 inhibitor therapy or after a washout actually for about 48 hours. And on the right side, she was restarted on her VMAT2 inhibitor. And we can see her after taking just one to two doses of her VMAT2 inhibitor with significant improvement that's very clinically obvious in her degree of stereotypy, Korea, and even one can see that when she walks, there's an improvement in her stability of gait because tranquil chorea and dystonic head tremor is improved. Let's take a look at this a little bit longer. And you can see when she's doing finger tapping, there's activation of the choreic movements, but much less facial and head rocking movements uh, on the right compared to the left. And we can see that on the right, you can see induction even of distal foot chorea when she is doing finger tapping with the hand. And this is a uh, very much less on the right after being on VMAT2 inhibitors. And here we can see the gait that I mentioned before, and you can see she's able to walk with a narrower base in a much more stable fashion, not staggering on drug compared to not being on the VMAT2 inhibitor. Oh, let's see if we can move this ahead. So, uh, uh, it's important as a neurologist to communicate with your referring a psychiatrist. Uh, uh, and as I mentioned, it's not in most patients who have severe psychiatric illnesses need to continue the antipsychotic to maintain good psychiatric care. So it's really not helpful to send a note back to the psychiatrist saying, hey, the offending agent is your antipsychotic, whatever it is, just stop the antipsychotic. The, the psychiatrist in general is aware of that option. Uh, and in general, of course, as I mentioned, just stopping the antipsychotic is not likely to result in resolution of the tardive dyskinesia. It may help in terms of preventing it from, from worsening over time, but usually is not going to get rid of the tardive dyskinesia. So it's important to communicate with the psychiatrist and work together with them. Often a phone call is helpful to talk about what's the best option. Can we add a VMAT2 inhibitor? Should we, can we consider switching the patient to a lower D2 receptor blocker, or do we just need to maintain the current medications because the psychiatrist has already tried that and that has not been successful, and we just need to treat the patient most effectively together. So uh, to, to reiterate, VMAT2 inhibitors are very effective with very good evidence uh, and are recommended to the American Academy of Neurology for patients with tardive dyskinesia. So to sum up, 
TD is a common disorder, which is becoming increasingly common with the increased use of atypical antipsychotics beyond patients who have primary psychotic illnesses, and it's becoming widespread in the use of affective disorders. Our under, we're beginning to understand more about tardive dyskinesia, its natural history, its path, and its pathophysiology, and it really affects patients' quality of life. The new treatments we have are highly efficacious and have a very good um, uh, body of evidence supporting their use. And we as neurologists can really help our psychiatric colleagues to treat these patients who are on or continue to be on antipsychotic medications uh, so that the patients can improve and have the best quality of life. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions along with my colleague, Dr. Uh, Shahed Jimenez. Thank you all for joining us again and welcome to the live q and I wanna welcome Dr. Kumar to uh, the discussion here. But before we begin, I would like to recognize that this session is supported by an independent educational grant from Neurocrine uh, Biosciences. So Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for uh, those um, for that presentation. And I think we kind of did that split. So it was a, a nice kind of uh, initial introduction to tardive dyskinesia and then, and then the actual treatment. So our first question from the audience is, um, is actually about haloperidol because that drug has been around for a while. And so is that really the type of medication at this point that is considered to be too risky to be in uh, regular use? Or how do you kind of view that medication, especially in the framework of tardive dyskinesia? Well, it depends on why you're using it. Haloperidol is a very strong D2 receptor antagonist. It's a classic D2 receptor antagonist. It's a great medication when used at the right time for the right patient. So if you have a patient who has refractory psychosis, that is not responding well to less uh, to uh, other D2 receptor blockers, starting with atypicals, for example, and then they need uh, a atypical, let's say, fluphenazine, for example, and that is still not strong enough. Aloperidol is the strongest. It's a baturophenone. So there's no reason one one can't use it, but all of the um, typical antipsychotics, the stronger the D2 receptor blockade, the stronger the or higher risk of tardive dyskinesia. So you should use it when it's indicated, but you should be warning your patient about the risks of using it. And I think that's really sort of one of the challenges with the uh, kind of landscape of dopamine receptor blocking use at this point. It's really, you know, there's certainly conditions where they're indicated and they're appropriate for usage, but it's really just sort of having that conversation with patients about what these medications are and what some of the potential long-term consequences are so the patients are informed and, and that you know that you need to be kind of watching for these things um, as, uh, as, as the treatment continues for these patients. So, um, another, go ahead. No, absolutely. I think that, of course, as you use a stronger D2 receptor blocker, the frequency of screening for the emergence of tardive dyskinesia then needs to be increased for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, a great habit to get into so that you can catch this as, as it's starting and, and hopefully take appropriate action. Um, what tips do you have? And I know this is partly my section, so but I'm going to let you try to take the first stab at answering. But what tips do you have to differentiate an atypical tardive dyskinesia from a functional disorder? I think that's a very interesting question and, and actually an important one because patients may come in with all different kinds of movements. What are some of the features that might suggest that it's organic versus, um, versus uh, functional? Well, I think that uh, the first things are to look at the classic things that might be uh, might lead you towards thinking about a functional movement disorder, such as abrupt onset, such as the coexistence of non-organic or non-physiologic findings, uh, distractibility, entrainment, uh, response to suggestion or placebo, all of these things, uh, and variability, of course. All of these things would, uh, would lead you to believe that the disorder may be functional. Now, there are certain characteristics of tardive dyskinesia which are helpful. For example, it'd be very uncommon to have somebody who has tardive dyskinesia who doesn't have involvement of the face also. So if you don't, if you have only limb involvement or truncal involvement, it's not a predominantly dystonic syndrome, it's truly choreic, it is probably, and you have zero involvement of the face, lips, tongue, this is be very unusual. And you gotta be thinking this is probably not tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is usually uh, worsened during certain activation, especially, for example, in the face. So if you have the patient perform rapid eye movements with the hand, it commonly worsens or brings out. So there's a worsening. If you see the opposite, the patient is distracted, uh, that should make you think this may be a functional disorder. So those are some simple steps. Please, I'm sure you'll have other good ideas. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the, those are all really good points. And I think, you know, probably the time course is, is one of the most single most important things in trying to figure out what's going on with the patient. And just remember, as you know, we talked about and, and presented that, um, you know, there are acute movement disorders that can happen after patients are, um, you know, uh, exposed to a dopamine receptor blocking drug. There are things that are maybe sort of in that intermediate range that maybe come in sort of weeks uh, after, and then there's the things that are really kind of truly latent. And so you do have to have this kind of high index of suspicion. First of all, you have to know to ask for the exposure. And then secondly, you have to establish what the relationship is between the um, onset of that exposure and the onset of the movement disorder. And then as Dr. Kumar mentioned, all of these different other sort of clinical features and historical features that can help you um, help you decide whether it's functional or not. But I think more than anything, tardive dyskinesia is it's consistent, it's patterned, it's, you know, you're likely to see it uh, in the same pattern under usual um, and even sometimes some distraction maneuvers that we might do. And so if you're seeing that same pattern happening over and over again, especially if it fits one of those phenotypes that we talked about, then, you know, you should, you should definitely have that index of suspicion. So definitely a good question. Um, so another one, let's go to uh, another audience member asked, does new onset of tardive dyskinesia result in any impact on cognition or intellectual ability? Is there any kind of relationship there? Well, there, that's a kind of a complicated question. We know that, pay, that there's an association with, if we look at all patients who have, for example, the same psychiatric disorder, let's say bipolar or schizophrenia, uh, comparing those people who have tardive dyskinesia and those people who don't. We know that, the, that if you do uh, comparative studies, that patients who have tardive dyskinesia tend to be worse cognitively. Some of that may be due to the underlying uh, psychiatric disease. Some of that may be due to their relative drug refractoriness too. Because of course, the patients who tend to get tardive dyskinesia are the patients who have been on higher doses for longer of different antipsychotics. So if a patient is doing relatively well, they're less likely to get, uh, get tardive dyskinesia. The other issue is of course, uh, the, something of a artifact of testing. If you have bad tardive dyskinesia, that may be quite distracting. And if your attentiveness is reduced, that's going to have a downstream effect on any cognitive testing that you do, working memory tasks. Well, if I'm distracted because I'm moving all over the place, it's going to impact my performance. So that's another issue. And then, of course, if you're having tardive dyskinesia, that can have a secondary effect on mood. And if I'm down in the dumps, you know, people who are depressed obviously perform poorly on cognitive testing. So that's another issue. Yeah, no, I think those are all, all very good points. But I think as sort of a you know, maybe as a, as a marker of sort of disease progression or anything, I don't know that we necessarily think of it in, in that sense. It's, it's mainly just a manifestation True. of, you know, sort of the treatments and, and the, you know, kind of interaction between, um, the, you know, the, the medicines that are used to manage psychiatric condition and um, the control of the movement. So um, slightly, yeah, I, I think a, a, another um, interesting point to, to kind of note about the population of patients that we're dealing with. So, um, so it's great that these medications are out here. We've got a couple of FDA approved options. How do patients get access to these medications? Well, it's, it's uh, well, first of all, we can prescribe the medications either to a regular pharmacy or a specialty pharmacy, depending on the medication, depending on the patient's insurance and uh, depending on caregiver issues. So, so we have a lot of different options. Uh, perhaps the uh, biggest issue with respect to access is cost also. These are very expensive medications. If one were to self-pay, very few patients could afford them. The good news is that for, for most patients, these are covered medications because they're indicated. As long as you have an adequate, a, a proper diagnosis, and you're, you're prescribing it on label. And there are, they are generally covered by most state Medicaid plans. So that is also good because a large number of these patients, of course, have been uh, terribly affected financially, and they're often on Medicaid, so that is good. For patients who are not on Medicaid, for patients who have commercial insurance, uh, for example, and we just write it to a regular pharmacy or specialty pharmacy, depending on our choice and what's appropriate in our institution, then um, they can often, a vast majority of patients qualify for patient assistance programs. It's a very small number of patients who don't. So for both uh, dutetrabenazine or valbenazine, that is the case. And I would say it's a rare patient who can't get on medication for that respect. And then lastly, you've got the Medicare population, uh, which is a little bit complicated because patient assistance programs are more difficult to access. So depending on the patient's insurance and depending on um, how well you can get the patient hooked up with the foundation, again, most patients can get access to the medication at an affordable price through subsidization through foundations. 
Uh, so it, there's a lot of uh, a lot of hoops sometimes to go through. What's good is that uh, typically for the patients who are uh, who who are not on Medicaid, for example, etc., by accessing some of the hub support systems through the different manufacturers, they can usually help the patient get on another get on one patient assistance program or the other for the, in the vast majority of cases. Yeah, no, thank you for, for that explanation. I think that um, you know, these medicines are not restricted to use by neurologists or psychiatrists. And so if you're a primary care or other practitioner who recognizes this phenomenology and you feel strongly that the patient needs to be treated, or perhaps you're assuming the care of somebody who is being chronically treated with these conditions, there's many different ways to access the medication. And so um, you know, I agree with uh, what Dr. Kumar described that when we're using it on label like that, it's often quite, um, quite available and, and, and patients who who really need it can get access to them. So that's a, definitely a, um, a good part of this um, that has emerged in the last couple of years as these drugs have become available.